Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. Hello, everybody. It's Kirk Henderson and Josh Bo coming to you on Monday night following a short break because the Mavericks don't play a back to back ever again. And Josh and I are delighted because that means we get time to actually think and breathe and come back to nice games where the Mavericks shook off a game winning, you know, the positive hangover to come back out and and beat the New Orleans Pelicans 108 to 92. Josh, how are you? I'm pretty good. Um I think there were some various points where I think our mental stability was was on the edge. Uh but the Mavericks, hey, what they they needed to beat this team by double digits and and they did. 16 point win. All's well, all's well that ends well, I, I suppose. <laughs> Yes, and I think we should probably start with the high points. So first of all, the Mavericks are now 5-0 and in their division. And division play with what the long term, I, I feel as if at a certain point the Mavericks will come back down to earth in some fashion. Right now they have won seven of their ten games. As Brad Townsend just noted, this is the best start since their 2014-15 season, to which I want to make this very clear. Do not fucking trade for Rajon Rondo. Do you understand that, Mavericks? Do not <laughs> trade for Rajon Rondo. Um, and you know they're they're in a they're in a good place right now because, frankly, we'll get to this in the second half of the podcast. Despite the lack of confidence that some of these wins give us, wins are wins are wins. And I, I think in terms of you know, the first 20 games of the season being very um, predictive in terms of what happens the rest of the year, the Mavericks are in a pretty, they're in the driver's seat, frankly. Yeah. And it helps that their division is just really bad. uh, Yeah. I mean, that's, that might be the, the saving grace for them this season because, you know, they play, you know, every NBA team plays the most, you know, they play a lot of games against your division. Uh, and if the division is this bad, the only other competent team seems to be the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, and even them, you know, they're going to be, they're a feisty team, but they're not, you know, you're not going to be too, too scared. Although they probably present a pretty intriguing matchup for this version of the Mavericks. But, uh, yeah, it helps to, to, to play in a, in a weak division and it helps to get all those games out early because it is obvious that the Mavericks are still working through some things and Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they're able to work through those things and have their best record since 2014, 2015 is, is a good thing. Uh, It's hilarious that they're doing it with an, you know, that's their best start in five or six years and they have a negative point differential, but (laughs) I I don't know. I mean, but they, you know, they did, they actually did, you know, some, some good things tonight uh that are worth talking about you know they did you know they did they did some bad things but uh there was enough good you know they 50 percent from the floor 40 percent from three finally a normal good shooting game for them uh they were bad at the free throw line but you know that's kind of is what it is but they finally made some shots and they finally made some shots and they won by 16 points like there's 
<laughs> that's co- correlation, causation, whatever. Like that's uh, we've been waiting for them to have a game like this, and they did, and they won handedly. Yeah, and I don't know. We were all so for those of you who don't know this. We have a Mavs Moneyball Slack where there's, you know, the 20 or so staffers who like to comment on the game. Like, we get, we, all of us tend to use Slack as a means to f- like talking out the feelings that we don't want to go public. And like that first quarter <laughs> was just textbook, like, okay, these guys look like shit. And thankfully, kind of Porzingis r- rescued them from a really rough start to the quarter with a a um, pair of threes, a nice a nice block, uh, and then the Mavericks sort of righted the ship in the second way or second half. Um, as as a follower just noted to me, <sighs> Jalen Brunson is, and this is important. Like he finished with a, in a, a plus twenty six in thirty one minutes. Like. Jalen Brunson is the team MVP to date because Luka just doesn't have it a lot of the times. Yeah, he finished 25, 5, and 5, but he also had five turnovers. His turnovers are, I don't want to say they're a problem, but they're definitely higher than they were under Carlisle because they're playing a little riskier. And he's doing some weird stuff. I I, I hope to I hope to talk to our our friend and staffer is talk Franco at some point about this, who who does some deep dives on the Mavericks data, but like the way the there's just some like oddities happening within the Mavericks offense that don't make me feel comfortable. And, and, you know, the starters, once again, like they keep rolling with this Dorian Finney Smith, Tim Hardaway, Dwight Powell, Chris Stapps, Porzingis, Luka Doncic starting lineup. And it just fucking sucks. Like we have data. Now we have 10 games of data that that starting lineup looks like shit. I, I don't know this feels like some sense of like stubbornness, like, Oh, we're going to make it work. Like Dwight Powell is not the player he was. He still does some interesting things and can be useful to this team, but him and heart, him and Finney Smith starting is, is an invitation for defenses to play harder on Luca and then on Porzingis and ask those guys to beat them. And here's a hint. Dorian's not going to beat you. You know, uh, I, I don't want to get. I thought you like, said we like, were starting with the positive. I'm, I'm just this. No, this is me being. This is me being pissy because I I, I, I did the thing that, that I read through some comments to some articles and I, look, guys, I love our fans. I love all of you guys who are reading and consuming our content. But if you think Dorian Finney-Smith and Reggie Bullock are comparable players, you don't know what you're watching, and I mean that out of love. Like, yeah, you look at the raw data and you can say, oh, well, so-and-so does so many things, points per possession, et cetera. Again, you don't know what you're watching. Dorian played 30 minutes tonight, scored six points, okay? Reggie played 21 minutes, scored 12 points. He's a better, more confident shooter. He's not a better offensive rebounder. He is a better defender. And really what I think that the Mavericks have to get to, and I'm rambling at this point, is Powell is causing so many challenges within the the lineup is that like we keep, we're we're having a very stupid, um, the fan base is having a bit of like a a stupid debate about who should be in a certain position when really the, the answer is to cut the Powell minutes like a lot, like get him out of the lineup and maybe play him as an eighth energy big man and not as a starter. Am I missing something? No, and I think <clears throat> I think the thing is that you know hoping for with the Pal Przingis lineup preseason, I think you know we talked about mm-hmm. how good the Pal Przingis duo was uh, in the 2019-2020 season before Pal injured his Achilles. I mean, they were legitimately great, uh, yep. and they were great in a good, decent amount of minutes. As you know, based almost half a season worth of data there. Um, but I think the thing that we just need to now process is that was under a different coach and a different style and a different scheme. And if there's one thing that we know about Rick Carlisle is that he very much valued having the rim running, diving, vertical spacing threat five man. And if we're learning something a little bit about the Jason Kidd, uh, Igor offense uh, is it's not as crucial. And that's not to say one is worse than the other, you know, we, but we have our opinions on that, but I don't want to get into that. I'm not trying to, compare the two and in, in saying which one's better they're just different and there's things that the Mavericks are doing on offense that are different from last year that I would say are better than, the, than what they're doing last year despite the fact that their, their offense hasn't looked great 
Um, but when you have Powell on the floor with Przingis and you're not, you know, you're screening with Powell, but the, there just doesn't seem to be that same oomph when he's running down the lane nope. because the spacing is different than, than last season's. And again, I don't want to get bogged down to and saying it's worse or better or whatever. I'm just saying it's different. And they're, you know, if you're not going to use Powell like Rick Carlisle used Powell, then he's a completely different player. And that's not to say that kids should be using, you know, like. No, I mean, no, kids know, should do this differently. Different. I'm, I'm yeah. feel comfortable saying this. Kids should do this differently. Like there was a Dwight yeah. Powell post up in which he scored. I'm delighted that he scored. Why is Dwight Powell posting up? What am I missing? Yeah. Yeah. There's he, just like elements of this offense to where it's like, let's make this more difficult. It's Dark Souls basketball. <laughs> and I, I don't see the point. I, and. I, and Oh, go ahead. No, you, you please, because I'm kind of at a loss when I'm when I'm I'm looking at this box score. And yeah, the Mavericks won, but it got down to eight points with four minutes left in the fourth quarter. It never should have got there. Like they should have blown the doors off this team and and really gotten a definitive win. And they really, you know, if you're looking at the box score, yeah, they did. But those of us who watched the game, it was like, what are like are the the Mavericks are playing with their food? Like this yeah. is weird. I think the thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, is that they clearly don't want to play Przingis at the five full time, oh, which is fair. Yeah, they just don't want to. They don't want to. I don't think they believe that he can hold up a full season. You know, and like you said, it's fair, uh, and they don't really have another option. I, I think if Maxi Kleba were healthy, I think they might have made the change and put Kleba in instead of Dwight Powell. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made that change. I believe he made that change. The game that. that Kleba got hurt if I, if I remember right, or I can't remember when, but, but Kleba did start right before he got hurt. So I wonder if Kleba was healthy, if he would be starting right now and we're kind of just arguing into the void. That's uh, and, about right. And, that, that's and, about our luck. Cause like we're arguing <laughs> over the fact, like, and I'm being bitchy about a seven and three team. So that's, right. that's no, fair. no, it's fine. I mean, they got a negative point differential. It's, it's a little smoke and mirrors, but like, sir, we <laughs> are, we are negative people with an agenda, <laughs> but I think that's, that's probably the reason. And they just don't. And when you look at, you know, Willie Colley Stein, who is just, uh-huh. He can't just play bye bye. He's yeah. He like play play Bobon. Play Bobon in yep. these minutes. I, I disagree with some some of our some of our wonderful listeners who were like, why isn't Bobon playing more? And I see I, I say it's speed of the game. Like, I don't care what Willie's plus minus is. He's gonna get somebody hurt. He's gonna like get somebody hung out to dry. He is an yeah. awful basketball player with no energy who plays like he's taking a T eight like, like a gummy before a game. I'm tired of watching him. He's not had a single impactful moment this year. Yep. And that makes it difficult because if the coaching staff, if they've made the directive that they're like, hey, we cannot play Kristaps at the five for 30 minutes a night. And it's like, okay, well, what do we do? Mm-hmm. Well, Kali Stein's bad. Uh, Boban is good, but only in, you know, the short doses. Well, Klebe is hurt. It's pal. And they, it sounds like they just don't want to change that. And the good thing is, is it's not like they're stubbornly sticking to it throughout the game. I mean, they're moving to it. They're moving off of it, you know, in the second quarter. And, you know, they're closing games with Chris Stops at the five. So uh, it, it gives me, you know, if you want to look on the brighter side, it gives me hope that when Kleba is healthy, he will return to, he will return to the starting lineup next to Chris Stops. Uh, and then Dwight can hopefully go back to going what should be his best role, which is like, you know, play balls out for, for, 10 to 12 oh 15, he, i mean he can shock sit like like if he's playing against benches i think yeah. he's much more effective and think about I, you know how much the bench needs some scoring if they ever decide to put brunson back into the starting lineup because you know that that bench has looked a little weary whenever brunson is not with it so uh you know that could be a consideration too but i want to go back to brunson because you know he was great in that plus 26 uh, really good he and that Just plus 26 so good. Was like yeah <laughs> there was no fool's gold there uh you talked about how he's like the Mavs MVP so far and I said that too on Twitter and some people like took that really seriously we're like what are you talking about it's Luke was averaging and I'm like I I get it I just made wanted to make the point that if you consider everything else on the team to be the same this season including Luca's play and then you took Brunson and you made him like 20 percent worse than what he is right now I mean the Mavericks would be like what two and eight or three and seven. I mean, it, it really feels like that. And, I, mean, I think and, it's true. 
I, I, you look at all the, look at every game the Mavericks have won this season and you see, you know, slow starts and you see close scores, except for this one. And then you look at Brunson and it's like 28 minutes plus 15 scored, you know, 18 points. And it's like, holy crap. Um, I, I want to kick it to you, but uh, it's got, it, the passing has been like the biggest difference to you, right? Like his assist totals have been significantly better so far this season compared to la- the previous seasons. Well, and it's not just the the totals, it's the kind of passes. So mm-hmm. I've been most critical of the fact that I didn't think he could make these reads. And I'm not sure as to why he wasn't making reads because last season, I, I mean, I, I looked all this stuff up. Like Porzingis was just, look. I'm sorry, Brunson was just looking off Porzingis, for example, in, in ways that he, you know, he's making little like just really shifty passes just the sort of like Ernest uh, Ernest got like point guard passes that he wasn't doing last year and there's been some I've heard some some sort of rumor sort of discussion about the fact that like he was told to do a specific thing by Carlisle so therefore he was doing that within the offense and you know at this point I'm kind of willing to believe it because that sort of like vision doesn't grow on trees like you don't just develop vision it's it's not a skill that a guy learns at 25 or however old Brunson is. He either wasn't making the pass because his edict was to get into the ball game and score, or he wasn't making the pass because he didn't have trust in his teammates. And I really have to think it it has to be the former. So I'm I'm really glad to see it because it's showing you know you know we we kind of bristled at at Chuck Cooperstein's notion over the summer of you know there there needs to be internal or what about internal improvement or or, or we're, you know, you Mavs fans are ignoring this. And in this instance with Brunson, I think there's some real validity to that. Yeah. And the thing is, is that it's not crazy, a crazy jump in terms of like efficiency. Like he's technically uh, less efficient uh, this season compared to last season, but he's also playing about three, three or four minutes more per game. He's taking about two to three more shots per game. So you expect there to be a little bit of a dip in efficiency. Uh So a lot of it can really, really tied to, you know, besides the passing, which seems to be a clear jump up from last season to this season. He's based, you know, I think Tim Cato at the athletic argued this. He's basically the same player. He's just playing more. Uh, And he's already got two starts this season. He had 12 all of last season and 60, you know, he played 68 games at 12 starts. He's played, 10 and has two so like he's already just being used more than than last last season which is part of it you know for a young player eventually you got to make that jump this is important to me like last year we talked about how i didn't think he could scale up his efficiency while if he was playing more because and you know this is not me just like talking out of my ass to date last year he 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 literally couldn't where in 2019, 2020, when he was a rookie and Luka got hurt and he was running the offense a lot, his numbers didn't improve. He just played more. And so the fact that he's in, you know, kind of keeping a pace, his efficiency is really important to what these guys want to do moving forward. Yeah. And he's taking more threes. Oh, he's taking about one more three per game, which is important. Unfortunately, he's not shooting them all that well. Uh, he's, Oh, what he was over two tonight, so he is two for his last twelve on three pointers, which just seems to be like the only thing holding him holding him back. If you want to say anything is holding him back, because he's mm-hmm. despite the fact that he's two of twelve in his last three games, he's still shooting well over fifty percent from the floor in those three games, and they're all three Mavericks wins. So he's still doing you know good things. So that's kind of the key. Like if you want to look at Brunson's game, you're like, okay, well, what, what's next? Like we're seeing him score more. We're seeing him keep his efficiency somewhat level, despite the increased minutes and usage what's next. And it's, can he find a way to be a, doesn't have to be like a Luca volume three point shooter, but can he be a guy that more can, that shoots just more threes? Like, can he bump himself up to that four to five range while keeping up like a good, you know, 35 to 37%. Uh, percentage like that's the thing that I'm going to look for 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 the rest of the season with him because obviously the passing looks significantly better he's still handling uh, his two-point efficiency is still terrific despite the fact that he's increased his issues a minute so uh, that's kind of the last frontier for him Uh, and the Mavericks will probably need it because you know it's it's the same roster for the last three years so it's unfair pressure 
I think on Brunson because he he's kind of like the one wild card on the team besides from Przingis, but it's kind of the way it is. So we'll see how he handles it for the rest of the season. Yeah, and again, like we said, this is mainly me where I get like irritated about particulars because I'm not, <laughs> and and we talk about this like. I'm not seeing where this team beats another playoff team, but then again, the NBA, and this is not a Maverick problem. So if, if you've not watched the league at large, the offense this year feels like it's stuck in the mud for a significant portion of the NBA. And I, I, I don't know, you know, maybe just things are different, um, which compared to previous years. So maybe I'm just wrong on all this. So, when we're harping on some of these things, it's mainly because if the Mavericks going to keep the same group and play kind of the same way, 10 games through an 82 game season, there are things that Josh and I are looking for the team to build upon to where we think they might be like playoff worthy or not, not even playoff worthy, like second round worthy is really like what, what like what changes in the playoffs is kind mm-hmm. of what we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Because to be honest, like, you know, we're well past with this roster patting yourself on the back for, for beating like a bad, you know, like that was for 2019, 2020 where they had to prove themselves that they were good and get back to the playoffs. So once you kind of roll the same roster out three years in a row with minor changes, everything I'm looking at is through the lens of, okay, well, how does this hold up in the playoffs? What will this look like in a, against a playoff opponent in a seven game series? So that's just the way I'm looking at it. Well, I mean, I think the last thing we kind of have to talk about just because it's standing out there like a sore thumb. I'm really glad that he finished with a positive plus minus. But <laughs> we need our man, Chris Stapps, who I think is very important to the offense, to hit a fucking shot, man. Like, he <laughs> – it's it's now and, – and I should have had this pulled up. He was 413 for the game. And he played a nice game the other night, and so it's like four of thirteen. Let me let me add this just to his his season long totals. He is now twenty four of sixty nine for the season. That is thirty five percent from the floor. <laughs> and there was this series of stuff, and like I don't know. I'm loath to criticize certain aspects of what I hear on the broadcast, but there was a repeated statement when Josh Hart was guarding Chris Tapps for Zingas that, oh, that's a mismatch. That's a mismatch. The Mavericks have to take advantage of the mismatch. It is not a mismatch. Chris Tapps is not a good post-up player. Small, stronger players bother Chris Tapps the same way Bruce Bowen and Sean Marion bothered Dirk Nowitzki. We just have a history of it. And I, I don't know why there's just this notion of Chris Stapps being a player that he isn't. There are going to be nights where Chris Stapps' best use is a seven foot three Clay Thompson. Tonight was one of those. The first play out of the second half, Luca got a post up. And Luca threw the ball out to Porzingis, and Porzingis was open. There was no one near him within five feet. He should have just heaved. Instead, he re-entered the post because he didn't want to take the shot. He he just didn't want to take the shot. And I I, I know people are probably tired the last two years of me killing this guy. I, I'm not meaning to be this way. I just don't understand how all of this sort of math level, like basic – this is what a guy is good at versus this is what he isn't good at is still how it's still an issue. Like, like he shouldn't have posted up tonight. He was one of five on two point shots. Don't, don't take those shots. Yeah. Entering tonight. He was three out of 10 on post-ups. I think he was in the 6.7 percentile of the mm-hmm. league. Uh, so that definitely went down. Um, you're right. You know, four thirteen doesn't look good. I think it's, Part of it is trying to accept like, you know, it looks worse when you have the expectation of like, well, he's supposed to be the second star Mm -hmm. and he's supposed to be the guy that, you know, averages 18 to 25 and and can go off for a 30 point night every now and then. But, you know, part of that might have to be just recalibrating expectations and just thinking like that's that's the outlier. Like that's not him anymore. And maybe. Maybe he shows us wrong because again, it's only been ten games. Sure, and it's no, best. No, there's plenty, of, and it's not even yeah. been ten games for him. That's his fifth game. <laughs> yeah, so it could be, it could look totally different in t- in two months. But uh, 
yeah, you know, it's just frustrating because you look at the starting lineup and it's Luca twenty five points, and then <laughs> and then you got a guy playing thirty. I mean, minutes. he scored he scored nine points and then didn't score again until the fourth quarter. He yeah. scored nine points in short succession, and part of where I get frustrated with him is not because I think he's bad because I I don't think he's bad. I think that he wants to do things that he is not as good at as he wants to be. I mean, players in the NBA and Jonas Valanciunas is not a fleet footed guy overplayed Porzingis's left hand from the top of the key to where if Porzingis would have taken two power dribbles. Cause again, guys, he's seven foot three. He has huge strides. He would have dunked the ball. But instead, he took one dribble right, pulled back to his left, and took a Carmelo Anthony jumper. And guys, newsflash, he missed. Like, (laughs) we have to, someone needs to, at a certain point, get through to him that that's not his best usage. And he either needs to bomb a catch and shoot three, which I, I have very full level confidence again. He shot three of eight from three tonight. If he shoots three of eight from three, the, that's a win for the Mavericks, right? Yeah. What is that like? Almost, I mean, it's like thirty-seven and a half percent. I think. Yeah, that's, like, that's fine. Freaking bananas! That breaks the defense. Yeah. And his in in his lasers of shots. I don't know. I'm talking too much much about Porzingis, and it's primarily not because of my last season where I'm crushing him, but because I think he's just he's just really important. Like the offense looks better when he exists. Yeah, it does. Even like he was so bad tonight, uh, individually with his shooting, but the team was fourteen to thirty-five from three. Like it just, <laughs> it goes to show you, just him standing on the floor is mm-hmm. makes a difference. Maybe that's why it's so frustrating because it's like, yes, man, if he's this good with doing nothing, like, well, he's. I don't mean Warren nothing. You're gonna have like full-on regression games, and then there's just gonna be, and you and I are, we're gonna get, you know, tweet. This is why you can't trade him, and it, blah, 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 blah. it's like I don't even care about that anymore. I just want them to win, and I want him to look good. Yeah, and so. uh, Dorian made two of four, so that helped. He made three of five uh, against Boston, so maybe he's in the in the process of that regression. Uh, I guess before we go, uh, good get, good get right game for Tim Hardaway Jr., who had Look quietly good. been not great for a little bit. Uh, feel like he went kind of under the radar. Like I don't, I didn't see a lot of people talking about his his slump uh, in these November games. So so that was good for him. Uh, and yeah, like you said, you know Reggie Bullock is looking looking really good. Uh, he seems like he's rounding into form and. That's huge. It's so huge. I mean, he only played 21 minutes, but man, like the fact that like Dorian doesn't have to play 37 minutes mm. in these games that, they're, yes. that they need to win is just, it's makes all the difference in the world. I mean, earlier I was griping about people who don't understand the difference between the two. And it's like, realistically, the point should be Dorian is at his best usage in about 28 minutes. Like anything, anything in the, if he's playing 35 minutes a game, then the Mavericks are either going super small or he is being misused. Like that's the only, they just have some guys in this team that can absorb minutes, which is, you know, last year we were screaming about. And and this year I want them like, like, like Frank Nelkina, who we've not even mentioned was a plus 24. <laughs> yeah. Entering tonight, his numbers weren't very good, but he looked like he was doing good stuff and tonight mm-hmm. the numbers at least match the uh the eye test so yeah that was nice i mean he looks he's such an at like man he's so long like it's just mm-hmm. it's nice to have that his jumper looks legitimately good like the form like the shooting form wise so i don't know maybe he can be kind of like what they wanted delon Wright to be uh yeah. just at a significantly cheaper price and not have to be relied on as as much but he can maybe fill that kind of gap on the roster well, I don't know. I had fun. That was a game where it was like fun to be mad. We're like, oh, we're only going to talk for 15 minutes. We've talked for 25. So that's just how this uh, this goes with us. It was, the, the, the team is interesting to talk about in specific ways. I will. They're, they're certainly not boring as been the sort of like one of those things that's been oft repeated via, through social media. I will say that they are frustrating, but again, frustrating in seven and three is something i think you and i will live with yeah i'll take it for now yeah uh they play the bulls next though so let's let's see they are what they've lost all three games against playoff expected playoff teams by like 
what 24 points a game or something like that so a bulls win would be pretty key because the bulls yeah. have hit a bit of a rough patch themselves um not terrible but just weird so so like two teams who are playing weird playing against one another is fun so it'll be wednesday night and that's a early ish game like 7 p.m uh start time so that's fun yeah let's get after it okay so i'm gonna probably slap the green room on the second half of this podcast because i hope um I was going to, you know, our, our staffer is talk. He's been doing more work for D magazine, but that's, you know, we, we don't begrudge anyone who works anywhere. Is talk and I are, are going to try to talk on Tuesday, just a little bit about what he's seeing um, since he gets to watch all these games, knowing what the score is. Cause he wakes up in the morning and sees <laughs> it, which is like, it sounds like a much more peaceful way to watch a basketball game, but you know, oh, yes. Yeah. So, and then maybe I'm going to slap that on our feed on Tuesday afternoon, and then you and I will be back on Wednesday, right? Yep. Sounds good. All right, guys. This has been Kirk Anderson and Josh Bo. We'll talk to you soon. This is advertiser content brought to you by Frito Lay. Hello, I'm Chip Murphy here to get you ready for the big tournament. Tonight we'll break down. We break down who will be cutting. Cut. What are you two doing? Sorry, Chip. Prez here got his feathers ruffled when I told him Ruffles has zero chance of winning the title. And I was letting Dip know that she is not taking into account Ruffles' iconic ridges. Guys, it's March. We have to start talking about the tournament. We are. It is the 2023 Frito-Lay Snackin'. We're talking about big-time matchups between Cheetos, Smart Food, Lay's, Sun Chips, and more. Just head to the Frito-Lay Snack Bracket and vote for your favorite chip, pretzel, or dip for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. This sounds great. Keep up the good work. Just go to Frito-LaySnackIt.SBNation.com. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends 4-3-2023. Void wherever hit Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at Frito-LaySnackIt.SBNation.com. Hello, friends. Kirk Henderson joining you for a Monday night edition of Mavs Moneyball Group Therapy. Coming to you about a half hour after... The Dallas Mavericks won their seventh game of the year to improve to seven and three. All right. I don't really think we have a lot to gripe about, folks, because again, the Mavericks are seven and three, their best start since the 2014 15 season. And as I just joked to Josh Bowe, the only thing the Mavericks can do to boof up this season is trade for Rajon Rondo. A uh, good thing Dirk isn't allowed to make uh, trade decisions like he was way back when okay so here's going to be the deal i don't want to talk forever um not because i don't love you guys but because there's not really much to say so i'm going to bring folks up we're gonna you know uh, issue your comment your question and then we're going to move on um i i forgot to watch succession last night and i really want to do that so um coming up first i would like to bring on longtime friend of the show christian christian what's happening Hey, what's up, Kirk? How you doing tonight? I am doing okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you hit it right on the head. There's not much to complain about. We beat a bad team, uh, but at the end of the day, we play who we're, you know, who's in front of us, and we're seven and three. Um, a couple things, you know, Jalen Brunson just really continues to impress, and. Uh, I saw him go to the right hand and drive and make that. Oh, that was good. That was good. Like it was such a fake out. Like there's no one. Yeah, that was fantastic to see. And, you know, hopefully he could keep that up to keep folks kind of, uh, you know, he always goes left. And so if he's able to really add that and be comfortable going to the right, I think uh, can unlock another, I don't know, dimension or, you know, aspect of his game. Sure, sure. So uh, what, what – so so give me give me two things you liked and one thing that, that concerns you. Two things that I like, uh, I think Frank. Uh, he's had maybe one or two poor games, um, but it was exciting to see him kind of continuing to do well, whether it's shooting the ball – 
He has more handles than I expected. Um, he really does. He really does. His handle is much nicer than I would have expected. And I remember uh, the pod that you had with the gentleman from that covers the Knicks uh, when we picked him up. And, you know, he talked about, you know, not really being able to drive and a few other things. But um, another thing that I'm really excited about is Reggie Bullock being able to kind of handle guys one on one on the defensive end. Um, and realistically, we have a group of maybe, you know, four guys that we can get out there at any given time. Um, if we need one stop at the end of the game, putting out, you know, a Reggie, uh, Frank, uh, Dorian, like where we have at least some solid defenders that might be able to end, um, those last second shots that killed us a couple times last year. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the thing that I, I, I'm still disheartened by, like KP needs to play the five. Um, I, I, I don't get why we're still sticking with it. We're 10 games in, I think. I do, but keep going. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond in the end. Okay. I, I definitely will be happy to hear it. Cause I just, I, I don't know. I just think he's best at the five. He's moving better on the defensive end, so he can actually play the five defensively this year. Um, and, you know, I, I really it, – it's unfortunate uh, in this sense. I'm, you know, kind of going a little bit off, but I really feel like we're a second star away from being a true contender. Um, and it's unfortunate it doesn't seem KP is that, but – Excited overall, you know, think we're going to be a good team. Um, but I am interested to hear why you think he's not at the five. So I was kind of reluctant to talk about this, but, you know, our, our Mavs Moneyball staffer, uh, D Magazine contributor, Is Talk Franco, posted something about Powell playing five today on Twitter that got my brain going. And he showed Powell contesting a corner three. And your back line big man not only has to be willing to protect the rim, but also has to be willing to move, to jump out to the corners. And I think the more the Mavericks ask Kristaps Porzingis to cover ground, the more they're asking for him to get hurt. We have all talked at length about how painful some of Kristaps' biomechanics are, particularly his landing on dunks. But if he's chasing three-point corner three points from skips, he's going to hurt himself. And I don't think the Mavericks want to put him in that position. I think that they want to play the, him at the five, like 15 minutes a game. The thing is, Powell is just not the guy. Willie Cauley-Stein is just not the guy. Moses Brown probably won't be the guy. And, um, you know, Boban can't be the guy either. That leaves Maxi, who is currently hurt. And that leaves the opportunity for a trade. Now, I love this question because it gives me the chance to plug something. Coming tomorrow, at some point, Lauren Gunn has turned in a piece, part one of kind of a two-part series of she uh, of, of big men options she wants all of us to keep an eye on because she thinks that position, you know, the just like a, a multifaceted big man can really correct some of the Mavericks options. And I, I agree with her. Um, the fact that they have like 19 centers, only two of which have any functional NBA skill. And then the third in, in Boban um, is very, he's, he's, I don't want to call him limited. It's just when Boban, and, and um, we talked about this the other night, when Boban gets exposed, the band did gets ripped all the way off. And it's not fair to him because he, he is really good on offense. He's a terrible defender and that's okay. But you know, they're going in. So anyways, what do you think about that? No, I I agree. And, you know, I think at this point, if we can keep KP relatively healthy, move in the way that he is for the playoffs, I think we'll be, you know, at the end, that's what really matters. Um, And I I would expect, because I believe it was in her piece from before, uh, maybe P.J. Washington being in there, especially considering the fact that he's – you know, not starting at this point and think he could kind of fit rather seamlessly into that role. Um, but yeah, definitely would like to see a move. Um, and, you know, it's nice having 
some depth. Uh, I think Frank surprising us, adding Reggie, has added a few options where we were very limited uh, last season. Yeah. But um, I, you know, appreciate the insight, Kirk. Appreciate you having me up, and I'll let uh, some other folks get up here. Thanks, thanks, buddy. Have a good night. Hope you're enjoying the uh, the cent- or the the new time zone as much as you can. Um, not being able to watch games that start at like you know five thirty at night. All right, Chris, what's happening? Hey, Kirk, can you hear me? All right. Well, yeah, I'm definitely not going to complain. I mean, this is just crazy that we're uh, playing this good. You know, uh, seven and three was last time we've been that good. I guess it was the 2014, 2015 season. Mm-hmm. So this this feels great. No, I mean, we're beating the bad teams. This is what we need to do because we got a tough stretch coming up. Uh, you know, Chicago on Wednesday. I mean, Spurs, we should win that one. And they got Denver next Monday. And then those uh, Suns and Clippers back to back games. So, I mean, we just got to win 50% of, you know, those games. And if we do lose a back to back game on a playing a good team, it's, it's kind of forgivable just as long as we're taking care of these bad teams. But it was kind of nuts how <laughs> we're up 22 points and we kind of like almost gave that game away against the Pelicans. But yeah, they got too cute. I mean, yeah, that, that's yeah. the difference with the three-point shot. I mean, I want to be mad about that, but I also, you know, I would be less mad if it would have been like Moses instead of Boban and KP playing together. Like, like, can we really truly clear the bench? I mean, somebody <laughs> who was this? I got a, I got a message about this, and I want to. Oh, okay. Um, a longtime listener, and and. Uh, Frank, who was at the game, said, please bring up that with 705, Kid put in KP and Luca back in the game after the bench was giving 100%, and they both came in complacent as hell. They looked so disengaged. And I don't know what to do about that sort of thing. Like, like the fact that they won was so important because I felt that a hangover game was coming. I mean, I try not to do this sort of stuff because I get murdered on social media to find anything other than like glowingly positive. And I just, I felt that a grumpy game was coming. And the fact that they shook off the rust and played reasonably well seems of value. I just wish that they could do the kind of thing where they truly close the door on a team and we can come into here and be like, hey, 20 minute green room, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And the garbage time, I mean, have Moses Brown in, have Josh Green in. It, it, it just sucks, man. I feel bad for Josh Green. Our, should I feel bad? I mean, this just sucks that that was our 18th overall pick last year. And we could have, I mean, I know we could have got Desmond Bay. We could have got Bay. I, just, I heard that podcast you had with jo- uh, Josh Bo, something about, uh, was it Donnie Nelson and Frank Bulgaris? Like Donnie Nelson wasn't even in the room or something like that uh, during draft day or so- something like that. About us getting Josh Green instead, or oh, I mean, the whole draft in 2020 was a mess. It, it... Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go through all that, but yeah, it just, it just, it just sucks that he's on the bench. It's just like, damn, it's just a waste of talent. It just, uh, I mean, he's not really talented NBA player. It just sucks. I, why is he on the team? We got Sterling Brown in there, and I tell you, he sucks so much ass. You better be careful. He's gonna OD on methane. I just, uh, Sterling Brown, man, he's. He sucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, not to not to derail the entire conversation, but we're probably not going to have to play the Denver Nuggets with Nikola Jokic as he got very unhappy with a uh, Markeith Morris elbow who elbowed him and then turned away, Ooh. and Nikola Jokic just blazed him in the back from behind to the point <laughs> to where, and I, I'm looking to see if this is actually true, but someone in my – in my uh, mention said that they're like carrying Markeith Morris out on a stretcher, which, Oh no, <laughs> you know, don't hope he's okay. Hope he's not that. Okay. If that makes any sense. Cause Morris brother. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> hope he's able to walk and provide for his family. Don't mind that he got knocked from behind. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the last thing I was going to say, just uh, yeah, hope Hardaway and D- for- Dorian Finney-Smith, and I'm glad he found his three-point shot, and Reggie Bullock hits those wide-open threes. If all those guys can hit threes, I mean, I think we're – I mean, we're 7-3 and three right now. This is 10 games yeah. in. You know, 15, 20 games in, we'll really see how, how we are. But I'm liking how, the, how things are going so far. Not the beginning of the season, but they just – it just takes a few games to sometimes kind of get your rhythm. But 
I, I'm liking this so far. So I'm liking this. Well, I mean, the, the real trick is with the NBA is you got to notch up wins where you can. And uh, I, if you Google, I should just tweet the link out. But there was something in 2019 about how the first 20 games of a team season is very predictive for how they do in the playoffs. Like they make the mm-hmm. playoffs 85% of the time. And for me, with how they've looked and been kind of sluggish, if they're in like a top four seed after after 20 games, I'm going to be pumped because I feel – Yeah, and that – Go ahead. I was just saying that's not counting – you know, we got Nikola Harrison. I mean, he might do a blockbuster trade in the middle of the season. Hopefully, we get something. I mean, we've got that draft pick. We can give away uh, the next year's draft pick, not this one. Is it this one we have to give up to the Knicks, right? And then mm-hmm. the next one, uh, 20. It's a good – love that you brought that up. So, um, Bibbs Corner, who, if you don't follow him on Twitter, he's much grumpier than me, and I recommend it. Um, <laughs> he, he, he said he basically blacked out and forgot that the Mavs owe the 2023 <laughs> to the Knicks. Yeah, and it's like, that's that why they're not, I mean, that's really why they don't do anything because they don't want to give up a future pick when they still owe one more. So, yeah. Well, I mean, at least KP I and mean, he's back. He, I mean, I was at that substance game. Like I mentioned, uh, he's looking good. I mean, if he sits out a game here, a game there and a, on a back to back, or if he gets injured, you know, as long as he's in the playoffs and playing good, I mean, let's just get past that first round yeah. first and we'll go from there. So, but that's, that's right. all I got. So, Thanks, Chris. Love the new profile photo, too. Oh, <laughs> thank you. All right. Talk with you soon. Have a good night. All right. We got one more ask. Frank, you're at the game. Frank, what's up? What's going on, man? Not much. Not much. How you doing? How was the game? You have a good time? I'm good, man. I, I DM'd you. You probably remember. Around 7.05, you brought a – and I don't know what you guys have been talking about. I, literally... I mentioned it already. I brought it up because you told me to. But go ahead. I want to no, hear – No, no. I, I, won't, I, won't beat a, uh, I won't beat the drum. Just uh, – I, I, I do have a theory, and I'm sure everybody agrees. But, Jay, you know, Luca is – he is deferring to JB a little more. You know, him and KP came in, and he got, he got a little more assertive. He missed a few bunnies. Uh, and then he said, all right, let me give us a JB. We'll let him kind of be the, uh, the tempo setter, the let's calm everybody down. Uh, and I think that's actually a good thing that he's on the court with JB at the same time. Not, not oh, obviously that's the obvious, right? But the point I'm making is Luca's so competitive and I think he's so competitive that even with his own teammates, he's, he's some, he's a showboat. We all know he's a showboat and I don't think he's going to like, not that he's taking it as JB showing him up. But I think the idea that if JB is going to be the guy that they start trying to defer to a little bit more in the fourth quarter, that might motivate Luca to pull his head out of his ass a little more and maybe sharp, you know, sharpen up a little bit more. You know, I know the Pelicans isn't the, the, litmus, the litmus test for that, but just as JB continues to show, hey, you know, I can, we can trust you and then we'll give you the ball you know, later in the game, maybe that sharpens Luca's focus a little more. And then, you know, and I'll just let you – I'll hang up and listen, but if you can just kind of pick up on that, maybe you disagree or agree. I don't know. Can do, Frank. Thanks for coming up. All right, so I can't remember the guy's name who came up here the other night, but he made. There's a guy who made an argument that he thought that Luca plays hardest with Brunson because Brunson plays hard, and that sort of inspires him to play harder. And I really like it, and I've been thinking about it for days because I think everyone else in the current starting lineup is very deferential to Luca's energy. And when Luca comes out looking like he ate a Whataburger, the team plays like they ate a Whataburger. That is of value. Luca is going to have to, you know, grow up over time and bring it and come ready to kill every single game. And, you know, I just don't think he's there yet. I mean, I know he's not there yet. Uh, but it's it's going to be fun worth watching because, again, like they're stumbling through and winning 70% of their games. Uh, and so it's like, we're just going to have to take this. All right. Coming up next, we have a, uh, really a, a special guest who was probably at the game. At least I assume he was, cause it's his job. The athletic zone staff writer, multi-talented former, uh, maps, money ball editor in chief, Tim. Kirk Henderson. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling, ha- I'm feeling all right. I'm going to get to go to bed before mid. <laughs> They uh they finished the post game press conference with uh with swiftness. So I am back at my apartment. Just got home. Jeez. Figured I'd hop on for just a second. Um, so yeah, I am also so, in a good place. 
you wrote an article, was it, yeah, I guess it was yesterday, that my, it was one of my favorite things because you did the thing that all of us good writers do, and I'm not a good writer, but you you referenced a lot of your earlier stuff and threw your hands up in the air, and you're like, I don't know what to write about Luca. So what do you do with a game like tonight where they won in a game they should have won, and that's kind of all there is to say? Yeah, I have, to, I have weird feelings about this win and just where the team is at right now because stacking wins up is good. Having seven wins in your first ten is good. Those are objectively good things. Like, what's the truth that we always say? Come back to your phone. Come back to your phone. No, Sounds like you're on cutting out. Okay. There we go. You got me now? Yeah, you sound good. Okay, my bad. Uh, yes. That's okay. We heard most of okay, it. Okay, okay. Stacking, you, you know, back. stacking wins in the first ten games is a good thing. We know that. And, you know, the classic trope is that, you know, nobody's going to care how they won these first 10 games. Uh, I just want to see, like, a little bit of improvement. Um, You know, I tweeted this, that good teams um, blow out bad teams. They do that not every single game, uh, but they do that sometimes, which the Mavericks haven't done. Um, I thought you sent a good tweet that was, like, net rating and plus minus. These things do matter. Uh, not so much individually, not so much for a single game basis, but it does matter. Um, and and I think I think you're right. Uh, that said, if uh, you know, I just I just want to see like positive linear progression in the right direction against teams like this. We got a little bit of that with the way that they're able to, you know, almost pull away in the fourth quarter, and then you know I think it got down to like twelve points, and you know it was clear they were going to win. Was it down to eight? Good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were always going to win this game. Uh, the Pelicans are running out players in their second unit that are not rotate, NBA rotation players. Like, they had two people right. who could create their own shot. And for whatever reason, uh, uh, what's his face? The the guard who was going off. I'm just totally blank on his name. Uh, Jalen Brunson's friend. Uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Uh, Alexander-Walker was a little bit. I said Josh Hart played really well. Josh Hart was I, I just completely blinked on his name there he was he was creating a little bit for himself in a way that he doesn't typically but they don't have players that can create for themselves and so i don't know i I would feel a little more optimistic if we started seeing better trend trends going in the direction at the same time it's like uh you know i just shot i just shot you a text and you're like yeah it's hard to be mad at a team that's seven and three and i agree i'm I'm definitely not out here to be insanely negative i just want to kind of point to the trends i think that's what i'm going to do when i write tonight um so, yeah, like there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. And those reasons are, you know, that we know exactly what this team can be um, because they're essentially the same roster they've been for a while. And we know that they have a ceiling that's higher well, than what they're doing right now. And if it just takes a little bit of time for that to all click in while the team is also winning, that's a good thing. Um, so let me throw you a grenade. Because all right. I, r- I really wish Brad Townsend, Dallas Morning News, hadn't put this out into the ether, but somebody would have if he didn't. It's the best start since the 2014-15 season, and you were <laughs> you were running our side at the time, and we were having an incredible time that year. I still remember Tim Brown wrote this, like, is this the best offense in history piece? And then Dirk demanded they trade for Rondo. Like, right. I, something stuck with me for a couple of days. Our, our mutual friend, Matt Moore of the Action Network, said that, like, this team doesn't look like they're having fun playing together. And he was clear to make the distinction. It's not that they don't like each other. It's just, like, that there's something amiss. Do you think that clears up if Dor- or if, if Maxi comes back from this oblique strain and they can just not work Powell out of the rotation, but, like, Every single lineup of Powell sucks. Like, it, there's not there's not a good justification for it outside of like the the you know leadership council demands it. Like, it's bad. And so it's like, do, do you think if they just like switch up their lineups a little bit, some of this maybe has a chance of clearing itself up a bit? I I think so. I think that's a reasonable interpretation. If you know, if the team remains committed to playing two bigs a lot of the time, um, which I think that it, there are defensible reasons they can give for why that is a beneficial thing to do long term, Maxi gives you a big that can absolutely and very easily survive as the second big pairing for whoever you want to put him with. Um, you know, I'm honestly at this point, like, I'm more interested in like, Maxi and Powell have been a good combo historically. 
Uh, Powell's not the player he was two years ago when those two had just insane net ratings when they were on the floor together. Uh, but I would feel even more comfortable with something like that, where Maxi's always just going to be that, you know, stand in the corner spacer that Chris Dubs clearly is not willing, not wanting, probably shouldn't be. Uh, he should be more involved, whereas Maxi does not need to be. So any variation, as long as you're, as long as uh, Kleba, if you're going to run two bigs, as long as it's Kleba out there as the second big, uh, along with KP or along with Powell or, you know, even Boban or whatever, and as long as they're also mixing in some one big lineups, I, I think that does help. I, I think that is something that would just free up the team to look a bit better. Um, you know, some of these dub lineups that you're describing with Powell, I think that becomes more fixable if you've got a healthy Maxi who can uh, who can take the place, you know, essentially take the starting role from Powell, play those minute rotations, and then you work Powell in, you know, here and there with second units and things like that. I still think Powell helps. Like, he just doesn't help against Jonas Valanciunas. Exactly. He helps against... And, and it's just sort of a... It's a distinction that to many people feel... It probably feels like without difference, but it's enough over the course of things where it's... Like, I, I asked Josh Bo to look at the two-man, like, lineups of just Dorian Finney-Smith and uh, Dorian Finney-Smith and Powell, who I think are kind of equal offensive negative forces at this point in the season. And it's like the net rating between the two of them is like <laughs> negative 16. <laughs> and like, yeah, that's right, like, right. that's not a winning formula. And yet the Mavericks are seven and three. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they're a, they're a team that's won seven of their 10 games and they're minus 23 on the season, which is. I, though it helps a bit like they're, they're and slightly concerning, but it's not all concerning. Like it, it, no. it could be okay. Like to some extent, like I said, like it's, you know, what a team is through 10 games is not representational of what their season needs to be, has to be. Um, There's a lot of stuff they can figure out as they go along. Um, You know, I I do want to see trends going more in that direction. Um, I'm glad that we saw a couple positive trends briefly in the second half. You know, I I think that if you mix the lineups around, this was probably a comfortable 30-point win that, you know, the the starters can actually rest for more than, you know, 50 seconds. So, yeah, you know, I am, I am, uh, you know, I try, it's funny, like I tweeted, I tweeted about, you know, how good teams will have bad teams, and I had like seven people tweet at me, you know, can we, can you just be optimistic? Uh, no, that's uh, not what I'm here for. Yeah, the replies range from like, <laughs> hey, please be optimistic because it makes me feel better to, you're a bad writer who hates this team. Um, no, no, that's and- me. That is me. Point them to me when they say these <laughs> things funny. to you. And it's funny because, like, like you reference, like I, I think, I think I find a lot of joy in this team, and I find a lot of joy in Luca, and it's, it's cool seeing him hit step back threes and being able to go back to stories I've written and things I've already expressed that you know right. still just so you know, you know, th- those are those are the highs that I feel about this team, and those are the best moments, and I, I love chances like the game on Saturday. You know, I didn't, wasn't planning to write anything, but at, when Luca hits that shot, like, you know, I want to. I want to write something. I want to call back to these things, you know, these positive feelings and vibes that I have about a player, um, you know, about the magic that the team was able to go from Dirk to Luca. you know, just the ridiculous, like, it's going to get, it's going to get weirder and weirder. It's going to feel so weird that Dirk and Luca were on a team together. That is something that's going to get weirder every single year and feel more anachronistic um, and that's awesome. Like, that is a really cool thing. That is an insanely cool thing. The way that Luca, you know, is able to hit shots like he did on Saturday, you know, the, the, you know, both the moxie and just the, the unexplainableness, but also what can be explained about just the way that his athleticism works. That's all cool stuff that, you know, I really enjoy. And at the same time, like, I look at the trends and I look at the numbers and I'm like, they're telling me something that uh, unfortunately is not quite as positive as, you know, all this other stuff. So, so to sum it up, I, I know it's, it sounded like this might've been your last question. I don't know if you Yeah. But yeah, or, just to sum it up, I think that there are, like you said, you know, it's, it's, you can't be too mad at any team that's seven and three. Uh, it, it's all about just understanding what those seven wins have been and understanding what trends need to start pointing upwards and more positive uh, you know, just to feel better about about where this team is. I'm very interested to see them against Chicago because the three losses were three teams that were better than them, like it, it, like clearly better than them, whereas Chicago feels much more like a team that's right on their exact level. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, yes, they beat Boston. That's probably their best win. But Boston has all its own weirdness, and Jalen Brown was out. So to be able to see them against a team that you know is as feisty and interesting and, and has had a good start to the season just like they have, but also if you look at the talent levels and you're like, yeah, these guys, you know, more or less, they even up, they even out. I'm very curious to see how that, that game goes. And I think, uh, you know, a win of any sort, especially, you know, if, if they can turn it into a convincing win, that, that would tell me some stuff uh, just as a, you know, a 10, 15 point loss would tell me. Um, and, and I just don't think we've had enough games this season that, that tell me things definitively about the team. Uh, no, so definitely that's, looking that's, to that's, <laughs> that's a really good, and that's probably what we should go out on because, like, there's there's two types of fans. There's the people that only want to be told the happy stuff and then ignore kind of the, the stuff until they hear until there's happy things to talk about. And then there's those of us who hop on an audio app on a Monday night at 11 o'clock to listen to quasi strangers talk about basketball. And like, we're stretching for things to talk about and that's okay. We'll figure there, there will be stuff to talk about. I mean, if, if they come through November with a, a, a 500 or better record, I'm going to be nothing short of ecstatic because their schedule looks a little hard, and they've opened up, you know, they, they, they beat the Celtics, which is a good start. Uh, looks like they're going to be playing a Jokic-less uh, th- uh, uh, Denver team who also is without, who will also probably be without Michael Porter Jr. May he come back in a healthy state. His back injury sounds pretty scary. Um, and then they'll be playing, you know, the, 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 the Suns twice and the Clippers twice. And like, there's, there's just a lot of good tests where I think we'll be able to return and actually have some, some more distinctive things to say. I'm looking forward to that double Suns, double, double Clippers trip. And not just because I'm traveling for that one. I think that's going to be a, a set of four games that will be fascinating to uh God, that's four three, straight road games. I didn't even put that games. together. It's, Shit. It's, yeah. The schedule's weird, dude. The schedule remains weird for COVID, but, uh, I think they like these home and home matchups. I think they like these kind of like baseball, the NBA, I mean, like likes these kind of baseball series because number one, it's hard to beat the same team twice. And number two, you get some really competitive pissy basketball when these guys face each other. That's a good point. That's a good point. I'm excited for it. And it's, it's fun to be able to see four road games with while taking three flights. That should be uh, that should be a good one. I'll turn. Yeah. Uh, I got a birthday in LA that first day I, I get there too. So uh, personally, selfishly, I'm uh, I'm kind of pumped for that as well. So outstanding, Absolutely. man. Wait, will you go and you go to bed before midnight and enjoy uh, well, enjoy I'm the ride a little bit. Take me an hour. Well, now go write a little bit, and we'll, right. we'll look for your article tomorrow. Subscribe to the Athletic People. Editor. I was the one telling you to do this. I don't like how the tables have turned, but I appreciate it. I need, I need, that, <laughs> I need someone yelling at me to go write, uh, so I actually go to bed on time. So I'm going to go do that. Good to talk, as always. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out, Tim. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love doing it. Uh, whenever they uh, get us out of the arena quickly, I, I'm, I'm – uh, there's times where I just uh, I just want to pop on and, and talk out my thoughts before I write anything, and that 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 it helps. It really it does. Really does. You'll probably write a bang up article then. We'll talk. We'll talk soon. Yeah. You'll be good. All right. See you, man. All right. Okay. Um, we're right at the half hour. I want to go to bed. You guys are great. Actually, I'm going to go watch the session. I lied to everyone. You guys are great. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm hoping to do a show tomorrow with Is Talk. Not sure if it's actually going to come together, but we'll see. Uh, everybody be good, uh, go Mavs and remember to subscribe, etc. And we will talk to you guys a little later in the week.